Okay, now. Okay. To conclude Black History Month, our sister's house is joining NCTE in their annual commemoration of books written by Black authors that elevate Black experiences. This annual event is called the African American Read-In. Each year, hundreds of thousands of people in bookstores and coffee shops and faith-based institutions, in prisons, in living rooms, and in kitchens, and everywhere else people gather, dedicate time in February, Black History Month, to explore Black literature, old and new. This quote is adapted from Stephanie Power Carter, Indiana University, and David E. Kirkland, NYU. Our sister's house and our partners is going to be reading a little bit from Angela Y. Davis, Women's Race and Class. Please enjoy. Um, from chapter five, The Meaning of Emancipation, According to Black Women. Cursed by canon, cried the Hebrew priest, a servant of servants, shall he be unto his brethren, are not Negro servants, ergo, upon such spiritual myths was the anarchism of American slavery built. And this was the degradation that once made many all servants, the aristocrats among colored folk. When emancipation came, the lure of house service for the Negro was gone. The path of salvation for the emancipated host of black folk no longer lay through the kitchen door with its wide hall and it lay you know, soon knew and knows in escape from menial serfdom after a quarter of a century of quote freedom quote vast number of black women were still working in the field made it into the quote big house and quote found the door for new opportunities sealed shut, unless they preferred, for example, to wash clothes at home for a medley of white families, as opposed to performing a medley of household jobs for a single white family. Only at infinitesimal number of black women had managed to escape from the fields, from the kitchens, or from the washroom. According to the 1890 census, there were 2.7 million black girls and women over the age of 10. More than a million of them worked for wages, 38.7% in agriculture, 30.8% in household domestic service, 15.6% in laundry work, and a negligible 2.6% in manufacturing. The few who found jobs in industry usually performed the dirtiest and lowest paid work, and they had not really made a significant breakthrough for their slave mothers had uh, for their slave mothers had also worked in southern cotton mills in the sugar refineries and even in the mines for black women in the 1890s freedom must have appeared to be even more remote in the further than it had been at the end of the civil war as during slavery black women who worked in agriculture as sharecroppers, tenant farmers, or farm workers were no less oppressed than the men alongside whom they labored long day, they labored day long. They were offered compelled to sign contracts with landowners who wanted to replicate the antebellum conditions. The contract's expirated date was frequently a mere formality since landlords could claim the workers owned them more than the equivalent of the prescribed labor period. In the aftermath of the emancipation, the masses of black people, men and women alike, found themselves in an indefinite state of peonage. Sharecroppers, who ostens whose ostensibly owned the products of their labor, were no better off than the outright peons. Uh, those who rented land immediately after emancipation rarely possessed money to meet their rent payments or to purchase other necessities before they harvested their first crop. Demanding a much as 30% in interest, landowners and merchants alike had mortgages on the crop. Of course, the farmers could pay no such interest. Any end of the first year, found them in debt. The second year, they tried again, but there was the old debt and the new interest to pay. And in this way, the mortgage system has gotten a hold on everything that it seemed impossible to shake off. 
Through the convict police system, black people were forced to play the same old roles carved out for them by slavery. Men and women alike were arrested and imprisoned at the slightest pretext and ordered by the lease out the authorities as convict laborers, whereas the slaveholders had recognized limits to the cruelty with which they exploited their valuable human property. No such cautions were necessary for the post-war planters who uh, rented black convicts for relatively short terms. In many cases, six Sick comments are made to toil until they're drop dead in their tracks. Using slavery as its model, the convict lease system did not discriminate between male and female labor. Men and women were frequently housed together in the same stock stockade and were yoked together during the workday. In a resolution passed by the 1883 Texas State Convention of Negroes, the practice of yoking or chaining male and female convicts together were strongly condemned. Likewise, at the founding convention of the Afro-American League in 1890, one of the seven reasons motivating the creation of this organization was the odious and demoralizing penitentiary system of the South, its chain gangs of convict leases and discriminating mixing of males and females. As W.E.B. Du Bois observed the profit potential of the convict lease system, persuaded many Southern planters to rely exclusively on con- a labor force of hundreds of nights. As a result, both employers and state authorities acquired a compelling economic interest in increasing the prison population. Since 1876, Dubois points out Negroes have been arrested on the slightest provocation and given long sentences or fines, which they were compelled to work out. This provision of the criminal justice system was oppressive to the ex-slave population as a whole, but the women were especially susceptible to the brutal assaults of the judicial system. The sexual abuse that they had routinely suffered during the era of slavery was not arrested by the advent of emancipation. As a, res- as a matter of fact, it was still true that colored women were looked upon as the legitimate prey of white men. And if they white men's sexual attack to be further victimized by a system which was returned to another form of slavery. Michelle? Yes. I think it's Pearl's time now. I don't know if Pearl's in here. Yes, go ahead, Pearl. I apologize. I don't have the thing pulled up. So. Oh, I can... Um, um. I can send it in our uh, in our work chat. During the post-slavery period, most Black women workers who did not toil in the fields were compelled to become domestic servants. Their predicament, no less than that of their sisters who were shop croppers or convict laborers, bore the familiar stamp of slavery. Indeed, slavery itself has been... Uh, euphemistically called the domestic institution. And slavers, our slaves have been designated as innocuous domestic servants. In the eyes of the former slaveholders, domestic servants must have been a courteous term for contemptible occupation, not a half step away from the laborer. While black women worked as cooks, nursemaids, chambermaids, and all-purpose domestic white women in the South unanimously rejects the line of workers outside the South. White women who worked as domestics were generally European immigrants who, like their ex-sisters, are compelled to take whatever employment they could find. We're on the last paragraph of page 54, Pearl. Or, yeah, page 54. The occupational equation of Black women with domestic service was not, however, a simple vestige of slavery destined to disappear with the passage of time. For almost a century, they would be unable to escape domestic work in any significant numbers. 
A Georgia domestic workers story recorded by New York journalists in 1912 reflected black women's economic predicament of previous decades, as well as for many years to come. For more than two thirds of black women in her town were forced to hire themselves out as cooks, nursemaids, washerwomen, chambermaids, hucksters, and janitorists, and were caught up in conditions just as bad, if not worse, than if it was during slavery. For more than 30 years, these black women had involuntarily lived in all households where she was employed. Working as many as 14 hours a day, she was generally allowed an afternoon visit with her own family only once every two weeks. She was, in her own words, the slave body and soul of her white employers. She was always called by her first name, never Mrs., and was not infrequently referred to as their nigger. In other words, their slave. One of the most humiliating aspects of domestic service in the South, another affirmation of its affinity with slavery, was the temporary revocation of Jim Crow laws as long as the black servant was in the presence of a white person. I have gone on the streetcars or the railroad trains with the white children, and I could sit anywhere I desired, front or back, if a white man happened to ask some other white man, what is that nigger doing in here? And was told, oh, she's the nurse of those white children in front of her. Immediately, there was a hush of peace. Everything was all right as long as I was in the white man's part of the streetcar or in the white man's coach as a servant, a slave. But as soon as I did not present myself as a menial, by my not having the white children with me, I would be forthwith assigned to the nigger seats or the colored people's coach. From Reconstruction to the present, Black women household workers have considered sexual abuse perpetuated by the man of the house as one of their major occupational hazards. Time after time, they have been victims of extortion on the job, compelled to choose between sexual submission and absolute poverty for themselves and their families. The Georgia woman lost one of her live-in jaws because I refused to let the madam's husband kiss me. Soon after I was installed as a cook, he walked up to me, threw his arms around me, and was in the act of kissing me. When I demanded to know what he meant and showed him away, I was young then and newly married and didn't know then what has been a burden to my mind and heart ever since that a colored woman's virtue in this part of the country has no protection. As during slavery times, the black man who protested such treatment of his sister, daughter, or wife could always expect to be punished for his efforts. When my husband went to the man who had insulted me, the man cursed him and slapped him and had had him arrested. The police fined my husband $25. After she testified under oath in court, the old judge looked up and said, this court will never take the word of a nigger against the word of a white man. In 1919, when the Southern leaders of National Association of Color Women drew up their grievances, the conditions of domestic service was first on their list. It was with the good reason that they protested what they politely termed exposure to morale temptations on the job. Undoubtedly, the domestic worker from Georgia would have expressed unqualified agreement with the association's protests in her words. I believe nearly all white men take and expect to take undue liberties with their colored female servants. Not only the fathers, but in many cases, the sons also. Those servants who rebel against such familiarity must either leave or expect a mighty hard time if they stay. Since slavery, the vulnerable condition of the household worker has continued to nourish many of the lingering myths about the immorality of black women. In this classic catch-22 situation, household work is considered degrading because it has been disproportionately performed by black women, who are in turn viewed as inept and promiscuous. But they're ostentable ineptness and promiscuity are myths which are repeatedly confirmed by the degrading work they're compelled to do. As W.E.B. Du Bois said, any white man of decency would certainly cut his daughter's throat before he permitted her to accept domestic employment. When black people began to migrate northward, men and women like the South were not fundamentally an actually freed slave. Girls that only stay outside the South, where the majority of Black has a post servants. In the 32 hours, the dominant occupation of Black people, all of the other occupation was proof that the Negroes are servants. Isabel Eaton's community. 
Pan-Asian Du Bois, 1899, 60% of domestic women, but 9% and 97 out of 15,704 of black women workers were employed as domestics. When they had slavery, they never opened to them. In researching her study, Eaton interviewed several women and who had been fired because they were compelled to work in the wall. 55 employers, one preferred white servants over black women. I think the colored people in regard to this. Um, is that they are racism work employer? is always faithful, trustworthy, and grateful media in this country for its numerous stereotypes of blurring service. The DOC's furnaces of member of the wedding and the aunt Jim have become stars. The one woman interviewed was that she actually employed black help because they Racism is he converged in the condition of the press to calculate the wages of black women servants. Immigrant women compelled to accept household employment earn a little more than their black counterparts. As far as their wage earning potential was concerned, they were closer by far to their black sisters than to their white brothers who worked for a living. If a white woman never received resorted to domestic work unless they were certain of finding nothing better. Black women were trapped in these occupations until the advent of the World War II. Even in the 1940s, there were streetcar markets in the New York and other large cities, modern versions of slavery auction block, inviting white women to take their picks from the crowds of black women seeking work. Every morning, rain or shine, groups of women with brown paper bags or cheap suitcases stand on the street corners in the Bronx and Brooklyn, waiting for a chance to get some work. Once hired on the slave market, the women often find another day's backbreaking toil and they work longer than was arranged, got less than was promised, were forced to accept clothing instead of cash, and were exploited beyond human endurance. Only the urgent need for money makes them submit to this routine daily. New York could claim about 200 of these slave markets, many of them located in the blocks, where almost any corner above 167th Street was a gathering point for black women seeking work. In a 1938 article published in The Nation, or Feudal Housewives, as the piece was entitled, were said to work some 72 hours a week, receiving the lowest wages of all occupations. The least fulfilling of all employment, domestic work, has also been the most difficult to unionize. As early as 1881, domestic workers were among the women who joined the locals of the Knights of Labor when it rescinded its ban on women membership. But many decades later, union organizers seeking to unite domestic workers confront the very same obstacles as their predecessors. Dora Jones founded and led the New York Domestic Workers Union during the 1930s. And by 1939, five years after the union was founded, only 350 out of 100,000 domestics in the state had been recruited. Given the enormous difficulties of organizing domestics, however, there was hardly a small accomplishment. White women feminists included have revealed a historical reluctance to acknowledging the struggles of household workers. They have rarely been involved in the Sisyphean task of ameliorating the conditions of domestic service. The convenient omission of household workers' problems from the programs of middle-class feminists, past and present, have often turned out to be veiled justification, at least on part of the affluent women of their own exploitative treatment of their maids. In 1902, the author of an article entitled A Nine-Hour Day for Domestic Service described a conversation with a female, 
feminist friend who had asked her to sign a petition urging fe- employers to furnish seats for women clerks. The girls, she said, have to stand on their feet 10 hours a day, and it makes my heart ache to see their tired faces. Miss Jones, I said, how many hours a day does your maid stand upon her feet? Why, I don't know, she gasped. Five or six, I suppose. At what time does she rise? At six. And at what hour does she finish a night? Oh, about eight, I think, generally. And that makes 14 hours. She can often sit down at her work. At what work? Washing, ironing, sweeping, making beds, cooking, washing dishes. Perhaps she sits for two hours at her meals and preparing vegetables. And four days in the week, she has an hour in the afternoon. According to that, your maid is on her feet for at least 11 hours a day with a score of stair climbings included. It seems to me that her case is more pitiable than that of the store clerk. My collar rose with red cheeks and flashing eyes. My maid always has Sunday after dinner, she said. <clears throat> yes, but the clerk has all day Sunday. Please don't go until I have signed that petition. No one would be more f- thankful than I to see the clerks have a chance to sit. The feminist activists were was perpetuating the very oppression she protested. Yet her contradictory behavior and her inordinate insensitivity was not without explanation. For people who work as servants are generally viewed as less than human beings. Inherent in the dynamic of the master-servant or mistress-maid relationship, said the philosopher Heigl, is the constant striving to annihilate the consciousness of the servant. The clerk referred to in this conversation was a wage laborer, a human being possessing at least a modicum of independence from her employer and her work. The servant, on the other hand, labored solely on the purpose of satisfying her mistress's needs. Probably viewing her servant as a mere extension of herself, the feminist could hardly be conscious of her own active role as an oppressor. As Angelina Gramagy had declared in her appeal to the Christian women of the South, white women who did not challenge the institution of slavery bore a heavy responsibility for its inhumanity. In the same vein, the Domestic Workers Union exposed the role of middle-class housewives in the presence of Black domestic workers. The housewife stands condemned as the worst employer in the country. Housewives in the United States make their million and a half employees work on an average 72 hours a week and pay them whatever they can squeeze out of their budget after the grocer or the butcher have been paid. Black women's desperate economic situation, they perform the worst of all jobs and are ignored to boot, did not show signs of change until the outbreak of World War II. On the eve of the war, according to the 1940 census, 59.5% of employed Black women were domestic workers, and another 10.4% were to non-domestic service occupations. Since approximately 16% still worked in the fields, scarcely one out of 10 Black women workers have really begun to escape the old grip of slavery. Even those who managed to enter, enter industry and professional work had little to boast about, and for they were consigned, as a rule, to the worst paid jobs in these occupations. When the United States stepped into World War II and the female labor kept the war economy rolling, more than 400,000 black women said goodbye to their domestic jobs. As the wars peaked, they had more than doubled their numbers in industry. And even so, and this qualification is inevitable, as late as 1960, at least one-third of black women workers remained chained to the same old household jobs, an additional one-fifth were non-domestic service workers. In a fiercely critical essay entitled The Servant in the House, Webby Du Bois argued that as long as the domestic service was the rule for black people, emancipation would always remain a conceptual abstraction. The Negro, Du Bois insisted, will not approach freedom until this hateful badge of slavery and medievalism has been reduced to less than 10%. The changes prompted by the Second World War provide only a hint of progress after eight long decades of emancipation. The signs of freedom were shadows so vague and so distant that one strained and squinted to get a glimpse of them. Chapter six, education and liberation, black women's perspective. Millions of black people and especially the women were convinced that emancipation was the coming of the Lord. This was the fulfillment of prophecy and legend. It was the golden dawn after chains of a thousand years. It was everything miraculous and perfect and promising. There was joy in the South. It rose like perfume, like a prayer. Men stood quivering, slim, dark girls, wild and beautiful, with wrinkled hair, wet silently. Young women, black, tawny, white and golden, lifted shivering hands, and old and broken mothers, black and gray, raised 
great voices a shout to God across the fields and up to the rocks and the mountains. A great song arose and the loveliest thing born this side of the sea. It was a new song and it's deep and plaintive beauty. It's great cadences and wild appeal, well throbbed and thundered on the world's ears with a message seldom voiced by man. It swelled and blossomed like incense, improvised and born anew of a long, an age-long past, and weaving into texture the old and new melodies in a word and in a thought. Black people were hardly celebrating the abstract principles of freedom when they held the advent of emancipation. As that, great human sob shrieked in the wind and tossed his tears up the sea. Free, free, free. Black people were not giving vent to religious frenzy. They knew exactly what they wanted. The women and the men alike wanted land. They wanted the ballot, and they were consumed with the desire for schools. Like the young slave child, Frederick Douglass, many of the four million people who celebrate emancipation had long since realized that knowledge unfits a child to be a slave. And like Douglass's master, the former slaveholders realized that if you give a nigger an inch, he will take it out. Learning will spoil the best nigger in the world. Master Hughes' prescription notwithstanding, Frederick Douglass secretly continued his pursuit of knowledge. Soon he could write all the words from Webster's spelling book, further perfecting his skill by examining the family Bible and other books in clandestinity of the night. Of course, Frederick Douglass was an exceptional human being who became an, a brilliant thinker, writer, and orator. But his desire for knowledge was by no means exceptional among Black people who had met, always manifested a deep-seated urge to acquire knowledge. Great numbers of slaves also wanted to be unfit for the harrowing ex existence they lead. A former slave interviewed during the 1930s, Jenny Proctor recalled the Webster spelling book, which she and her friends had surreptitiously studied. None of us was allowed to see a book or try to learn. They say we get smarter when we was, if we learn anything, but we slips around and gets a hold of the Webster's old black blue book speller and we hides it away till way in the night. And then we light a light pine torn, torch and studies that spelling book. We learn it too. I can read some now and write a little too. Black people learned that emancipation's 40 acres and a meal was a malicious rumor. And they would have to fight for land. They would have to fight for political power. And after centuries of educational deprivation, they would zealously assert their right to satisfy their profound craving for learning. Thus, like their sisters and brothers all over the South, the newly liberated black people of Memphis assembled and resolved that education was their first priority. On the first anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation, they urged the Northern teachers to make haste and to bring their tents with them ready for erection in the field by the roadside or in the fort and not to wait for magnificent houses to be erected in time of war. The mystifying powers of racism after eminent from its irrational topsy-turvy logic, according to prevailing ideology, black people were allegedly incapable of intellectual advancement. After all, they had been chattel, naturally inferior as compared to the white epitomes of humankind. But if they were really, they really were biologically inferior, they would have manifest neither the desire nor the capacity to acquire knowledge. Ergo, no prohibition of learning would have been necessary. In reality, of course, Black people have always exhibited a furious impatience as regards to the acquisition of education. This yearning for knowledge had always been there. As early as 1787, Black people petitioned the state of Massachusetts for the right to attend Boston's free schools. After the petition was rejected, Prince Hall, who was the leader of this initiative, established a school in his own home. Perhaps the most stunning illustration of this early demand for education was the work for an African-born woman who was a former slave. In 1793, Lucy Terry Prince boldly demanded an audience before the trustees of the newly established Williams College for Men, who had refused to admit her son into the school. Unfortunately, the racist prejudices were so strong that Lucy Prince's logic and eloquence could not sway the trustees of this Vermont institution. Yet, she aggressively defended her people's desire for and the right to education. Two years later, Later, Lucy Terry Prince successfully defended a land claim before the highest court of the land, and according to the surviving record, she remains the first woman to address the Supreme Court of the United States. 1793 was also the year an ex-slave woman who had purchased her freedom established a school in the city of New York, which was known as Katie Ferguson's School for the Poor. 
Her pupils, whom she recruited from the poorhouse, were both black and white, 28 and 20 respectively, and were quite possibly both boys and girls. 40 years later, the young white teacher, Prudence Crandall, steadfastly defended black girls' right to attend her Canterbury, Connecticut school, and Crandall persistently taught her black pupils until she was dragged off to jail for refusing to shut down her school. Margaret Douglas was another white woman who was imprisoned in Norfolk, Virginia for operating a school for black children. And the most outstanding examples of white women's sisterly solidarity with black women are associated with black people's historical struggle for education. Like Prudence Crandall and Margaret Douglas, Marital Minor literally risked her life as she sought to impart knowledge to young black women. In 1851, when she initiated her project to establish Black Teachers College in Washington, D.C., she had already instructed Black children in Mississippi, a state where education for Blacks was a criminal offense. After Marital Minor's death, Frederick Douglass described his own incredulousness when he first announced her plans to him. During their first meeting, he wondered about her seriousness in the beginning, but then he realized that the fire and enthusiasm lighted in her eye and that the true made a uh, martyr spirit flamed in her soul. My feelings were those of mingled joy and sadness. Here I thought it another enterprise, wild, dangerous, desperate, impractical, and destined only to bring failure and suffering. Yet I was deeply moved with the admiration for the heroic purpose of the delicate and fragile person who stood or rather moved to and fro before me. It was not long before Douglas recognized that None of the warnings he issued to her, and not even the stories of the attacks on Prudence Crandall and Margaret Douglas, could shake her determination to found a college for Black women teachers. To me, the proposition was reckless, almost to the point of madness. In my fancy, I saw this fragile little woman harassed by the law, insulted in the street, a victim of slaveholding malice, and possibly beaten down by the mom. In Frederick Douglass's opinion, relatively few white people outside the anti-slavery activists would sympathize with marital minor's cause and support her against the mob. This was a period, he argued, of diminishing solidarity with black people. Moreover, the District of Columbia was the very citadel of slavery, the place most watched and guarded by the slave power and where humane tendencies were more steadily detected and sternly opposed. In retrospect, I'm however, I think it's David's turn now. Thank you. I do not know where exactly we're at. So we're on page 62, and Pearl just finished um, that last quote on page 62. So it's like halfway through the page. Mm. In retrospect. Second quote, you said? Uh, starting at in retrospect. Oh, in retrospect, however, Douglas confessed that he did not really understand the depth of this white woman's individual courage. Despite the grave risk, marital, um, yeah, minor opened her school in the first of, in the fall of 1851. And within a few months, her initial six students had grown to 40. She taught her black students passionately over the next eight years, simultaneously raising money and urging congressmen to support her efforts. She even acted as a mother to the orphan girls whom she brought into her home so that they might attend the school. And my Torella, uh, minor, struggled to teach and as her pupils struggled to learn, they all fought evictions arson attempts and their other misdeeds of racist stone throwing mobs they were supported by the young women's families and abolitionists such as harriet beecher stowe who donated a portion of the royalties she received from the sale of uncle tom's cabin my Torella minor may have been a frail uh, been frail as frederick douglas observed but she was definitely formidable and she always able at less in time to discover the eye of that racist storm early one morning however she was abruptly awakened by the odor of smoke and raging flames which soon consumed her schoolhouse 
Although her school was destroyed, the inspiration she provided lived on, and eventually Miners Teachers College became a part of the District of Columbia public education system. I never passed a minor normal school for colored girls, so Frederick Douglass uh, confessed in 1983. Without a feeling of self-reproach that I um, could have said ought to quench the zeal, sake, shake the, mm, I guess, faith in quail, the courage of noble women by whom it was founded and whose name it bears. Sisterhood between black and white women are indeed, was indeed possible. And as long as it stood on the, a firm foundation, as with this remarkable woman and her friends and students, it could not give birth to earth shaking accomplishments, accomplishments. And then my tell, Minor kept the candle burning that others before her, like Grimmick Sisters and Prudence Crandall, um, had left uh, as a powerful legacy. It could not have been a mere historical uh, coincidence. So many of the white women who defended their black sisters in the most dangerous of situations were involved in the struggle for education. They must have understood how urgently black women needed to acquire knowledge, a lamp unto their people's feet and a light unto the path toward freedom. Black people who did receive academic instruction inevitably associated their knowledge with their people's collective battle for freedom. As the first year of black schooling in Cincinnati drew to a close, pupils who were asked, what do you think, mo uh, think most about? Furnish these answers. First, we are going to be good boys. And when we get a man to get the poor slaves from bondage, and I am sorrow to hear that the boat of Tisquilla, Tis, yeah, uh, went down with 200 poor slaves. It graves, grieves my heart so that I could faint in one minute, seven years old. Second, what are we studying for is to try to get the yoke of slavery broke and the chains parted asunder and slaveholding cease for ever, 12 years old. Third, um, bless the cause of abolition. My mother and stepfather, my sister and myself were all born in slavery. The Lord did uh, let pose, uh, po a sorry. Uh, the Lord did let the oppressed go free, roll on happy period, roll on the happy period that all nations shall know the Lord. We thank him for his many blessings. And then fourth, this is this is in, to inform you that I have two cousins in slavery who are entitled to their freedom. They have done everything that they will inquires, and now they won't let them go. They talk of selling them down the river. If this was your case, and what would you do? The last surviving answer came from a 16-year-old attending this new Cincinnati school. It is an extremely fascinating example of the way of the students gleaned a contemporary meaning from world history that was close to home as a desire to be free. Let us go back and see the state in which the Britons and Saxons and Germans lived. They had no learning and had not a knowledge of letters, but not look. Some of them are our first men. Look at the King Alfred and see what a great man he was. He at one time did not know his ABC, but before the death, before his death, he commanded armies and nations. He was never discouraged, but always looked, but always looked forward and studied the harder. I think if the colored people study like King Alfred, they will soon do away with the evil of slavery. I can't see how the Americans can call this a land of freedom. So much slavery is. As far as black people's faith and knowledge 
was concerned, the 16-year-old said, said it all. This unquenchable, unquenchable thirst for knowledge and was a powerful, uh, was as powerful among the slaves in the South as among their free sisters and brothers in the North. Needless to say, anti-literacy restrictions of slave states were far more rigid than in the North. After the Nat Turner revolt in 1931, legislation prohibit, prohibiting the education of slaves was strengthened throughout the South. In the words of one slave code, teaching slaves to read and to write to ten dissatisfaction um, in their minds and to produce insurrection and rebellion. With the exception of Maryland, oh wait, mm, and dysfunction in their minds, oh wait, uh, the exception of Maryland and Kentucky, every Southern state abs um, absolutely prohibited the education of slaves. Throughout the South, slaveholders resorted to the lash and the whipping post in order to counter their slaves' irresponsible way to learn. Black people wanted to be educated. Uh, the potency of the slaves struggled for learning that um, appeared everywhere. Frederica Drim Dr Brimmer found a young woman desperately trying to read the Bible. Oh, this book. She cried out to Miss Bremer. I turned and turned over its leaves and I wished I understood what is on them. I try and I try and I should so happy if I could read, but I cannot. Susie King Taylor was a nurse and teacher in the Black Regiment of Civil War. In her autobiography, she described her persistent efforts to educate herself during slavery. White children, sympathetic adults, as well as her grandmother assisted her to acquire the skills of reading and writing. Like Susie King's grandmother, numerous slave women ran great risks that they imparted to their sisters and brothers to academic skills they had secretly procured. Even when they, even when they were compelled to convene their schools during the late hours of night of the night, women who had managed to acquire some knowledge attempted to share it with their people. These were some of the early signs in the North and the South alike of the post-emancipation phenomenon, which Du Bois called a frenzy for schools. Another historian described ex-slaves' first thirst for learning in these words. With a, a yearning born of centuries of denial, ex-slave worshipped the sight and sound of printed word. All men and women on the edge of the grave would be seen in the dark of the night, poring over the scripture by the, the light of a pine note, not painting, painfully spelling out the scarred words. Words. According to yet another historian, many educators reported that they found a near desire to learn among the Negro children of Reconstruction South than among white children in the North. About half of the volunteer teachers who joined in a massive educational campaign organized by the Freedom Freedom Men's Borough were women. In Northern white women went south during Reconstruction to assist their black sisters who were absolutely determined to wipe out illiteracy among the millions of their former slaves. The dimensions of this task were Herculean. Uh, according to Du Bois, the prevailing illiteracy rate was 95%. In the histories chronicling the Reconstruction era and in the historical accounts, historical accounts of the women's rights movement, the experience of black and white women working together in the struggle for education have received sparse attention. Judging, however, from the articles in Freeman's 
record, these teachers, these teachers undoubtedly inspired each other and were themselves inspired by their students. Almost universally mentioned in the white teachers' observations was the former slave's unyield, unyielding commitment to knowledge. In the words of the teacher working in Ralph, North Carolina, it is surprising to me to the amount of the suff amount of suffering which many of the people endure for the sake of sending their children to school. Material comfort was unhesitantly sacrificed for the furtherance of educational progress. A pile of books is seen almost every cabin, though there be no furniture except a poor bed, a table, and two or three broken chairs. As teachers and the black and white women seem to have developed profound and intense mutual appreciation. A white woman working in Virginia, for example, was immensely impressed by the work of the black women of a black woman teacher who had just emerged from slavery. It seems almost a miracle. This white woman exclaimed that a colored woman who has been a slave up to the time of surrender would succeed in a vocation to to her so novel in the reports she authored the black woman in question expressed sincere uh, sincere though by no means servile servile gratitude for the work of her friends from the north by the time of Hayes' betrayal and the overthrow of the radical reconstruction, the accomplishments in education had become one of the most powerful proofs of progression during that potentially revolutionary era. Fisk University, Hampton Institute, and several other black colleges and universities have been established in the post-Civil War South. Some 2,000 247 and 33 pupils were attending 4,329 schools, and these were the building blocks for the South's first public school system, which would benefit black and white children alike. Although post-Reconstruction period and the attendant rise of Jim, uh, Jim Crow education drastically diminished black people's education opportunities. The impact of Reconstruction experience could not be entirely obliterated. The dream of the land was shattered for the time being in the hope of political uh, equality waned. But the beacon of knowledge was not easily extinguished, and this was a guarantee that the fight for land and for political power would unrelentingly go on. Had it not been for the Negro school and college, the Negro would, to all intents and purposes, have been driven back to slavery. His Reconstruction leadership had come from Negroes' education in the North and white politicians, capitalists, and philanthropic teachers. The, the, encount, the encounter revolution, no, the encounter educated in the, yeah. Revolution of 1876 drove most of these save the teachers away. But already, though, establishing public schools and private colleges and by organizing the Negro church and the Negro had acquired enough leadership and knowledge to thwart the worst designs of the new slave drivers. Aided by their white sister allies, black women played in impressionable role in creating this new fortress. The history of women's struggle for education in the United States reached a true peak when black and white women together led the post-Civil War battle against illiteracy in the South. Their unity and solidarity preserved and confirmed some of our history's most fruitful promises. Thank you, David. One morning, Oh, sorry. I was just saying thank you. Um, so now we're going to chapter 
nine. And then we'll be reading um, chapter nine and 12. Um, and I don't think anybody's, Kai's not here, so I don't think anybody signed up for the rest of the time. So I'm just gonna read. If you wanna jump in, just type something in the chat and then interrupt me because I'll be looking at my screen. So I'll start reading chapter nine. I'll wait a little bit so that everybody can get there. Um, and it's page 81 on the PDF, by the way. Okay, I'm going to start reading. Chapter 9, Working Women, Black Women, and the History of the Suffrage Movement. In January 1868, when Susan B. Anthony published the first issue of Revolution, working women whose ranks in the labor force had recently expanded had begun to defend their rights conspicuously. During the Civil War, more white women than ever before had gone to work outside their homes. In 1870, while 70% of women workers were domestics, one-fourth of all non-farm workers in general were female. Within the garment industry, they had already become the majority. At this time, the labor movement was a rapidly expanding economic force compri comprising no less than 30 nationally organized unions. Inside the labor union, labor movement, however, the influence of male supremacy was so powerful that only the, the cigar makers and printers had opened their doors to women, but some women workers had attempted to organize themselves. During the Civil War and in its immediate aftermath, the sewing women constituted the largest group of women working outside their homes. When they began to organize, the spirit of unionization spread from New York to Boston and Philadelphia and to all the major cities where the garment industry flourished. When the National Labor Union was founded in 1866, its delegates were compelled to acknowledge the sewing women's efforts. At the initiative of William Silvis, the convention resolved to support not only the daughters of toil in the land, as the sewing women were called, but the general unionization of women and their full equality with respect to wages. When the National Labor Union reconvened in 1868, selecting Silvis as their president, the presence of several women among the delegates, including Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, compelled the convention to pass stronger resolutions and generally treat the cause of working women's rights with greater seriousness than before. Women were welcomed at the 1869 founding convention of the National Colored Labor Union. As the Black workers explained in one resolution, they did not want to commit the mistakes here, heretofore made by our white fellow citizens in omitting women. This Black labor organization, created because of the exclusionary policies of white labor groups, proved by its practice to be more seriously committed to working women's rights than its white counterpart and predecessor. While the NLU had simply passed resolution, resolution supporting women's equality, the NCLU actually elected a woman, Mary S. Carey, to serve on the organization's policymaking executive committee. Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton did not record any acknowledgement of the Black Labor Organization's anti-sexist accomplishments. They were probably too absorbed in the suffrage, suffrage battle to take note of the important development. In the first issue of Anthony's Revolution, the newspaper financed by the racist Democrat George Francis Train, the overall message was that women should seek the ballot. Once the reality of women's suffrage was established, so the paper seemed to say it would be the millennium, millennium, millennium for women and the final triumph of morality for the nation as a whole. We shall show that the ballot will secure for women equal place and equal wages in the world of work, that it will open to her the schools, colleges, professions, and all the opportunities and advantages of life, that in her hand it will be a moral power to stay the tide of crime and misery on every side. Though its vision was often too narrow, narrowly focused on the ballot, revolution played an important role in the struggles of working women during the two years it was published. The demand for the eight-hour day was repeatedly raised within the pages of the paper, as was the anti-sexist slogan, equal pay for equal work. From 1868 to 1870, working women, especially in New York, could rely upon revolution to publicize their grievances, as well as their strikes, their strategies, and their goals. Anthony's involvement in women's labor struggles of the post-war period was not restricted to journalistic solidarity. 
During the first year of her paper's publication, she and Stanton used the Revolution's office to organize printers into the Working Women's Association. Shortly thereafter, the National Topographers became the second union to admit women, and in the Revolution's offices, the Women's Typographical Union Local Number One was established. Thanks to Susan B. Anthony's initiative, a second Working Women's Association was later organized among the sewing women. Although Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and their colleagues on the paper made important contributions to the cause of working women, they never really accepted the principle of trade unionism, as they had been previously unwilling to concede that Black liberation might claim momentary priority over their own interests as white women. They did not fully embrace the fundamental principles of unity and class solidarity without which the labor movement would remain powerless. In the eyes of the suffragists, woman was the ultimate test. If the cause of woman could be furthered, it was not wrong for women to function as scabs when male workers in their trade were on strike. Susan B. Anthony was excluded from the 1869 convention of the National Labor Union because she had urged women printers to go to work as scabs. In defending herself at this convention, Anthony proclaimed that Men have great wrongs in the world because of the existence of labor and capital, but these wrongs as compared to the wrongs of women in whose faces the doors of the trades and vocations are slammed shut are not as a grain of sand on the seashore. Anthony's and Stanton's um, postures during this episode were astonishingly similar to the suffragist anti-Black position within the Equal Rights Association. As Anthony and Stanton attacked black men when they realized that the ex-slaves might receive the vote before white women, so they lashed out in a parallel fashion against the men of the working class. Stanton insisted that the exclusion from the NLU proved what the revolution has said again and again, that the worst enemies of women's suffrage will ever be the laboring classes of men. Women were the test, but not every woman seemed to qualify. Black women, of course, were virtually invisible within the protracted campaign for women's suffrage. As for white working class women, the suffrage leaders were probably impressed at first by the organizing efforts and the militancy of their working class sisters. But as it turned out, the working women themselves did not enthusiastically embrace the cause of women's suffrage. Although Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton persuaded several female labor leaders to protest the disfranch disfranchisement of women, the masses of working women were far too concerned about their immediate problems, wages, hours, working conditions, to fight for a cause that seemed terribly abstract, according to Anthony. The great distinctive advantage possessed by the working men of this republic is that the son of the humblest citizen, black or white, has equal chances with the son of the richest in the land. Susan B. Anthony would never have made such a statement if she had familiarized herself with the realities of working class families. As working women know all too well, their fathers, brothers, husbands, and sons who exercise the right to vote continue to be miserably exploited by their wealthy employers. Political equality did not open the door to economic equality. Woman wants bread, not the ballot, was the title of a speech Susan B. Anthony frequently delivered as she sought to recruit more working women into the fight for suffrage. As the title indicates, she was critical of the working women's tendency to focus on their immediate needs, but they naturally sought tangible solutions to their immediate economic problems, and they were seldom moved by the suffragist promise that the vote would permit them to become equal to their men, their exploited suffering men. Even the members of the Working Women's Association organized by Anthony in the offices of her newspaper elected to refrain from fighting for suffrage. Mrs. Stanton was anxious to have a Working Women's Suffrage Association, explained the first vice president of the Working Women's Association. It was left to a vote and ruled out. The society at one time compromised over 100, comprised over 100 working women, but as there was nothing practical done to ameliorate their condition, they gradually withdrew. Early in her career as a women's right leader, Susan B. Anthony concluded that the ballot contained the real secret of women's emancipation and that sexism itself was far more oppressive than class inequality and racism. In Anthony's eyes, the most odious oligarchy, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce that, ever established on the face of the globe was the rule of men over women. 
an oligarchy of wealth where the rich govern the poor, an oligarchy of learning where the educated govern the ignorant, or even an oligarchy of race where the Saxon rules the African must be endured. But this oligarchy of sex, which makes father, brothers, husbands, sons, the oligarch over the mother and sisters, the wives and daughters of every household, which ordains all men's sovereigns, all women's subjects, carries discord and rebellion into every home of the nation. Anthony's staunchly feminist position was also a staunch reflection of Berg, Ber, I don't know how to pronounce this. I study sociology in undergrad too. Ber, anyways, ideology. And it was probably because of the ideology blinding powers that she failed to realize that working class women and black women alike were fundamentally linked to their men by the class exploitation and racist oppression which did not discriminate between the sexes so while their men's sexist behavior definitely needed to be challenged the real enemy their common enemy was the boss the capitalist or whoever was responsible for the miserable wages and unbearable working conditions and for racist and sexist discrimination on the job i saw your message michelle or pearl <laughs> thank you so working women did not raise the banner of suffrage in mass until the early 20th century, when their own struggles forged special reasons for demanding the right to vote. When women struck the New York garment industry in the renowned uprising of the 20,000, during the winter of 1909 to 1910, the ballot began to acquire special relevance to working women's struggles. As women labor leaders began to argue working women could use the vote to demand better wages and improved conditions on the job. Women's suffrage could serve as a powerful weapon of class struggle. After the tragic fire at the New York Triangle Squirt Shirt Waste Company claimed the lives of 146 women, the need for legislation prohibiting the hazardous conditions of women's work became dramatically obvious. In other words, working women needed the ballot in order to guarantee their very survival. The Women's Trade Union League urged the creation of wage earner suffrage leagues a leading member of the New York Suffrage League, Lenora O'Reilly, developed a powerful working class defense of women's right to vote. Aiming her argument at the anti-suffrage politician, she also questioned the legitimacy of the prevailing cult of motherhood. You may tell us that our place is in the home. There are 8 million of us in these United States who must go out of it to earn our daily bread, and we come to tell you that while we are working in the mills, the mines, the factories, and the merc mercantile houses, we are not the protection that we should have. We have been making laws for us, and the laws you have have not been good for us. Year after year, working women have gone to the legislature in every state and have tried to tell the story of their need. Now, so Lenora O'Reilly and her working class sisters proclaim, they were going to fight for the ballot, and indeed, they would use it as a weapon to remove all of those legislators from office whose loyalties were with the big business. Working class women demanded the right to suffrage as an arm to system in the ongoing class struggle. This new perspective within the campaign for women's suffrage bore witness to the rising influence of the socialist movement. Indeed, women socialists brought a new energy into the suffrage movement and defended the vision of struggle born of the experiences of their working class sisters. Of the 8 million women in the labor force during the first decade of the 20th century, more than 2 million were Black. As women who suffer the combined disabilities of sex, class, and race, they had possessed a powerful argument for the right to vote. But racism ran so deep within the women's suffrage movement that the doors were never really open to Black women. The exclusionary policies of the NAWSA did not entirely deter Black women from raising the demand for the vote. Ida B. Wells, Mary Church Terrell, and Mary McLeod Bethune were among the most well-known Black suffragists. Margaret Murray Washington, who was a leading figure of the National Association of Color Women, confessed that personally women's suffrage has never kept me awake at night. This casual indifference may well have been a reaction to the racist stance of the National American Women's Suffrage Association, for Washington also argued that color women quite as much as colored men, realize that there is ever to be equal justice and fair play in the protection in the courts everywhere for all races, then there, will, there must be an equal chance for women as well as men to express their preference through their votes. As Washington points out, the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs established a suffrage department to impart to its members knowledge about governmental affairs. 
So that women may be prepared to handle the vote intelligently and wisely, the entire Black Women's Club movement was imbued with the spirit of women's suffrage. And despite the rejection they received from the NAWSA, they continued to defend women's right to vote. When the Black Northeastern Federation of Clubs applied for membership in the NAWSA as late as 1919, just one year before victory, the leadership's response was a repeat of Susan B. Anthony's rejection of Black women's suffragists a quarter century earlier. Informing the Federation that its application could not be considered, the NAWSA leader explained that if the news is flashed throughout the southern states at this most critical moment that the National American Association has just admitted an organization of 6,000 colored women, the enemies can cease from further effort, the defeat of the amendment will be assured. Still, Black women support the battle for suffrage until the very end. Unlike their white sisters, Black women suffrage enjoyed the support of many of their men. Just as a Black man, Frederick Douglass, had been the most outstanding male advocate of women's equality during the 19th century, so W.B.D. Du Bois emerged as the leading male advocate of the women's suffrage in the 20th century. In a satirical, a satirical uh, article on the 1913 suffrage parade in Washington, Du Bois described the white men who hurled jeers as well as physical blows and over 100 people were injured as the upholders of the glorious traditions of Anglo-Saxon manhood. Wasn't it glorious? Does it not make you burn with shame to be a mere black man when such mighty deeds are done by the leaders of civilization? Does it not make you ashamed of your race? Does it not make you want to be white? Concluding the article on a serious note, Du Bois quotes one of the white women marchers who said that black men had been unanimously unanimously respectful. Of the thousands watching the parade, not one of them was boisterous or rude. The difference between them and those insolent, bold white men was remarkable. This parade, whose most sympathetic male specters were black, was rigidly segregated by its white women's organizers. They even instructed Ida B. Wells to leave the Illinois con contingent and to march with the segregated black group in deference to the white women from the South. Their request was made publicly during the rehearsal of the Illinois Contiguant, and while Miss Barnett, Ida Wells, glanced about the room looking for support, the ladies debated the question of principle versus expediency, most of them evidently feeling that they must not prejudice Southerners against suffrage. Ida B. Wells was not one to follow racist instructions, however, and at parade time, she slipped into the Illinois section. As a male advocate of woman suffrage, W.E.B. Du Bois was so peerless among black and white men alike. His militants, his eloquence, and the principal character of his numerous appeals caused many of his contemporaries to view him as the most outstanding male defender of women's political equality of his time. Du Bois' appeals were impressive not only for their lucidity and persuasiveness, but also for their relative lack of male supremacist undertones. In his speeches and writings, he welcomed the expanding leadership roles played by black women who are moving quietly but forcibly towards the intellectual leadership of the race. While some men would have interrupted, interpreted this rising power of women as a definite cause for alarm, W.E.B. Du Bois argued that on the contrary, this situation created a special urgency for extending the ballot to black women. The enfranchisement of these women will not be a mere doubling of her vote and voice in the nation, but will lead to a stronger and more normal political life. In 1915, an article entitled The Votes for Women, a Symposium for Leading Thinkers in Colored America was published by Du Bois in The Crisis. It was the transcript of a forum whose participants include judge, ministries, university professors, elected officials, church leaders, and educators. Charles W. Chestnut, Reverend Francis J. Grimke, Benjamin Brawley, and the Honorable Robert H. Terrell was some of the many male advocates of women's suffrage who spoke during this symposium. The women included Mary Church Terrell, Anna Jones, and Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin. The vast majority of the women who participated in the forum on women's suffrage were affiliated with the National Association of Colored Women. In their statements, there were surprisingly few invocations of the popular argument among white su suffragists that women's special nature, their domesticity, and their innate immorality gave them a special claim to the vote. There was one glaring exception, however. Nanny H. Burrow, educator and church leader, carried the womenly morality thesis so far as to imply the absolute superiority of black women over their men. 
Women needed the, no the vote, Boro insisted, because men had battered and sold this valuable weapon. The Negro woman needs the ballot to get back by the wise use of it what the Negro man has lost by his misuse of it. She needs it to ransom her race. A comparison with the men of her race in moral issues is odious. She carries the burden of the church and of the school and bears a great deal more than her economic share in the home. Of the dozen or so women participants, Burroughs alone assumed a position which rested on the convoluted argument that women were morally superior, implying, of course, that they were inferior to men in most other respects. Mary Trish Terrell spoke on women's suffrage in the 15th Amendment, Anna Jones on women's suffrage and social reform, and Josephine St. Prayer Ruffin described her own historical experiences in the women's suffrage campaign. Others focused their remarks on working women, education, children, and the club life. In concluding her remarks on women and colored women, Mary Talbert summed up the admiration for black women expressed through the symposium. By her peculiar position, the colored woman has gained clearer powers of observation and judgment, exactly the sort of powers which are today peculiarly necessary to the building of an ideal country. Black women have been more than willing to contribute those clear powers of observation and judgment to the creation of a mutual racial movement for women's political right. But at every turn, they were betrayed, spurned, and rejected by the leaders of the Lily White White Woman suffrage movement. For suffragists and club women alike, black women were simply expendable entities when it came to time to woo Southern support with a white complexion. As for the women's suffrage campaign, it appears that all those consensus to the Southern women made very little difference in the end. When the votes of the 19th Amendment were tallied, the Southern states were still lined up in the opposition camp and in fact, almost managed to defeat the amendment. After a long awaited victory of women's suffrage, black women in the South were violently prevented from exercising their newly acquired right. The eruption of the Ku Klux Klan violence in places like Orange County, California, brought injury and death to black women and their children. In other places, they were more peacefully prohibited from exercising their new right. In the Armacus, Georgia, for instance, more than 250 colored women went to the polls to vote, but were turned down or their ballots refused to be taken by the election manager. In the ranks of the movement, which had so firmly fought for the enfranchisement of women, there was hardly a cry to protest to be heard. Thank you, Pearl. So now we're gonna skip over to page 117 on the PDF and start, um, I said 117, 117 and start chapter 12. And this will be our last chapter. And again, if you wanna jump in, just say in the chat or interrupt, I'll try to um, take a look at the chat every few minutes. Um, okay, so, Chapter 12, Racism, Birth Control, and Reproductive Rights. When 19th century feminists raised a demand for voluntary motherhood, the campaign for birth control was born. Its proponents were called radicals, and they were subjected to the same mockery as had befallen the initial advocates of women's suffrage. Voluntary motherhood was considered a doshes, outrageous, and outlandish by those who insisted that wives had no right to refuse to satisfy their husband's sexual urges. Eventually, of course, the right to birth control, like women's right to vote, would be more or less taken for granted by U.S. public opinion. Yet in 1970, a full century later, the call for legal and easily accessible abortions was no less controversial than the issue of voluntary motherhood, which had originally launched the birth control movement in the United States. Birth control, individual choice, safe contraceptive methods, as well as abortions when necessary, is a fundamental pre prerequisite for the emancipation of women. Since the right of birth control is obviously advantages to women of all classes and races, it would appear that even vastly dissimilar women's groups would have attempted to unite around this issue. In reality, however, the birth control movement has seldom succeeded in uniting women of different social backgrounds, and rarely have the movement's leaders popularized the genuine concerns of working class women. Moreover, arguments advanced by birth control advocates have sometimes been based on blatantly racist premises. The progressive potential of birth control remains indisputable, but in actuality, the historical record of this movement leaves much to be desired in the realm of challenges to racism and class exploitation. The most important victory of the contemporary birth control movement was won during the early 1970s when abortions were at, at last declared legal. 
Having emerged during the infancy of the new women's liberation movement, the struggle to legalize abortions incorporated all the enthusiasm and the militancy of the young movement. By January 1973, the abortion rights campaign had reached a triumphant culmination, culmination in Roe v. Wade and Doe v. Bolton. The U.S. Supreme Court ruled that a woman's right to personal privacy implied her right to decide whether or not to have an abortion. The ranks of the abortion rights campaign did not include substantial numbers of women of color. Given the racial composition of the larger women's liberation movement, this was not at all surprising. When questions were raised about the absence of racially oppressed women in both the larger movement and in the abortion rights campaign, two explanations were commonly proposed in the discussions and literature of the period. Women of color were overburdened by their people's fight against racism and slash or they had not yet become conscious of the centrality of sexism. But the real meaning of the almost lily white complexion of the abortion rights campaign was not to be found in an ostensibly myopic or underdeveloped consciousness among women of color. Consciousness among women of color. The truth lay buried in the ideological underpinnings of the birth control movement itself. The failure of the abortion rights campaign to conduct a historical self-evaluation led to a dangerously superficial appraisal of Black people's suspicious attitudes towards support control in general. Granted, when some, peop- when black- when some black people unhesitantly hesit- when- granted when some black people unhesitantly <laughs> equated birth control with genocide, it did appear to be an exaggerated, even paranoid, par- paranoid reaction. Yet white abortion right activists missed a profound message for underlying these crises of genocide were important clues about the history of the birth control movement. This movement, for example, had been known to advocate involuntary sterilization, a racist form of mass birth control. If ever women would enjoy the right to plan their pregnancies, legal and easily easily accessible birth control measures and abortions would have to be complemented by an end to sterilization abuse. As for the abortion rights campaign, itself, how could women of color fail to grasp its urgency? They were far more familiar than their white sisters with the murderously clumsy scalpels of inept abortionists seeking profit in illegality. Illegality. (laughs) In New York, for instance, during the several years preceding the decriminalization of abortions in that state, some 80% of the deaths caused by legal abortions involved Black and Puerto Rican women. Immediately afterward, women of color received close to half of all the legal abortions. If the abortion rights campaign of the early 1970s needed to be reminded that women of color wanted desperately to escape the backroom quack abortionists, they should have also realized that these same women were not about to express pro-abortion sentiments. They were in favor of abortion rights, which did not mean that they were proponents, proponents of abortion. When Black and Latina women resort to abortions in such large numbers, the stories they tell are not so much about their desire to be free of their pregnancy, but rather about the miserable social conditions which dissuade them from bringing new lives into the world. Black women have been aborting themselves since the earliest days of slavery. Many slave women refuse to bring children into a world of interminable forced conditions forced labor, where chains and floggings and sexual abuse for women were the everyday conditions of life. A doctor practicing in Georgia around the middle of the last century noticed that abortions and miscarriages were far more common among his slave patients and among the white women he treated. According to the physician, either Black women work too hard or, as the planners believed, the Blacks are possessed of a secret by which they destroy the fetus at an early stage of gestation, all All country practitioners are aware of the frequent complaints of planters about the unnatural tendency in the African female to destroy her offspring. Expressing expressing shock that whole families of women failed to have any children, this doctor never considered how unnatural it was to raise children under the slave system. The previously mentioned episode of Margaret Garner, a fugitive slave who killed her own daughter and attempted suicide herself when she was captured by slave catchers, is a case in point. She rejoiced that the girl was dead. Now she would never know what a woman suffers as a slave and pleaded to be tried for murder. I will go singing to the gallows rather than be returned to slavery.
Why were self-imposed abortions and reluctant acts of infanticide such common occurrences during slavery? Not because Black women had discovered solutions to their predicament, but rather because they were desperate. Abortions and infanticides were acts of desperation motivated not by the biological birth process, but by the oppressive conditions of slavery. Most of these women, no doubt, would have expressed their deepest resentment had someone hailed their abortions as a stepping stone toward freedom. During the early abortion rights campaign, it was too frequently assumed that legal abortions provided a viable alternative to the myriad problems posed by poverty. As I have fewer children, as having, as of having fewer children, could create more jobs, higher wages, better schools, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This assumption reflected the tendency to blur the distinction between abortion rights and the general advocacy of abortions. The campaign often failed to provide a voice for women who wanted the right to legal abortions while deploring the social, social conditions that prohibited them from bearing more children. The renewed defensive against abortion rights that erupted during the latter half of the 1970s has made it absolutely necessary to focus more sharply on the needs of poor and racially oppressed women. By 1977, the passage of the Hyde Amendment in Congress had mandated the withdrawal of federal funding for abortions, causing many state legislators to follow suit. Black, Puerto Rican, Chicana, and Native American Indian women, together with their impoverished white sisters, were thus effectively divested of the right to legal abortions. Since surgical sterilizations funded by the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare remained free on demand, more and more poor women have been forced to opt for permanent infertility. What is urgently required is a broad campaign to defend the reproductive rights of all women and especially those women whose economic circumstances often compel them to relinqu relinquish the right to reproduction itself. Women's desire to control their reproductive system is probably as old as human history itself. As early as 1844, the United States Practical Receipt Book contained among its many re recipes for food, household chemicals and medicines, receipts for birth preventative lotions to make Hanny's preventative lotion, for example, which is um, take pearl lash, one part water, six parts mix and filter, keep it in a closed bottles and use it with or without soap immediately after connection. For Abernethy's preventative lotion, take Bichloride of mercury, 25 parts. Milk of almonds, 400 parts. Alcohol, 100 parts. Rose water, 1,000 parts. Immerse the glands in a little of the mixture, infallible if used in proper time. While women have probably always dreamed of infallible methods of birth control, it was not until the issue of women's rights in general became the focus of an organized movement that reproductive rights can emerge as a legitimate demand. In an essay entitled Marriage, written by the 18, written during the 1850s, Sarah Grim, Grimke argued for a right on the part of women to decide when she shall become a mother, how often, and under what circumstances. Alluding to one physician's humorous observation, Grimke agreed that if wives and husbands alternatively gave birth to their children, no family would ever have more than three, the husband bearing one and the wife two. But as she insists, the right to decide this matter has been almost wholly denied to a woman. Sarah Grimke advocated women's rights to sexual abstinence. Around the same time, the well-known emancipated marriage of Lucy Stone and Henry Blackwell took place. These abolitionists and women rights activists were married in a ceremony that protested women's traditional relinqu rel relinquishment of their rights to their persons, names, and property. In agreeing that as husband, he had no right to the custody of the wife's person, Henry Blackwell promised that he would not attempt to impose the dictates of his sexual desires upon his wife. The notion that women could refuse to submit to their husband's sexual demands eventually became the central idea of the call for voluntary motherhood. By the 1870s, when the women's suffrage movement had reached its peak, feminists were publicly advocating voluntary motherhood. In a speech delivered in 1873, Victoria Woodhill claimed that the wife who submits to sexual intercourse against her wishes or desires it virtually commits suicide, while the husband who compels it commits murder and ought just as much to be punished for it, as though he strangled her to death for refusing him. Woodhill, of course, was quite notorious as a proponent of free love. Her defense of a woman's right to abstain from sexual intercourse within marriage as a means of controlling her pregnancies was associated with Woodhill's overall attack on the institution of marriage. It was not a coincidence that women's consciousness
got cut off. Call for birth control was associated with goals, which could only be achieved by one possessing material wealth. Vast numbers of poor and working class women would find it rather difficult to identify with the embryonic birth control movement. Toward the end of the 19th century, the white birth rate in the United States suffered a significant decline. Since no contraceptive interventions had been publicly introduced, the drop in the birth rate implied that women were substantially curtailing their sexual activity. By 1890, the typical native-born white woman was bearing no more than four children. Since U.S. society has become, has, was becoming increasingly urban, this new birth pattern should not have been a surprise. While farm life demanded large families, they became dysfunctional with the context of city life. Yet, this phenomenon was publicly interrupted, interpreted in a racist and anti-working class fashion by the ideologies of rising monopoly capitalism. Since native-born white women were bearing fewer children, the specter of race suicide was raised in official circles. In 1905, President Theodore Roosevelt concluded in his Lincoln Day dinner speech with the proclamation that race purity must be maintained. By 1906, he blatantly equated the falling birth rate among native-born whites with the impending threat of race suicide. In his State of Union message that year, Roosevelt admonished the well-born white woman who engaged in willful ster sterility and the one sin for which the penalty is national death, race suicide. These comments were made during a period of accelerating racist ideology and of great, rate, great waves of race riots and lynchings on the domestic scene. Moreover, President Roosevelt himself was attempting to muster support for the U.S. seizure of the Philippines, the country's most recent imperialist venture. How did the birth control movement respond to Roosevelt's accusation that their cause was promoting race suicide? The president's propaganda ploy was a failure, according to a leading historian of the birth control movement, or ironically, it led to a greater support for its advocates. Yet, as Lyndon, Linda Gordon maintains, this controversy also brought to the forefront those issues that most separated feminists from the working class and the poor. This happened in two ways. First, the feminists were increasingly emphasizing birth control as a route to careers and higher education, goals of, re of reach of the poor with or without birth control. In the context of the whole feminist movement, the race suicide episode was an additional factor identifying feminism almost exclusively with the aspirations of the more privileged women of society. Second, the pro-birth control feminists began to popularize the idea that poor people had a moral obligation to restrict the size of their families because large families created drain on the taxes and charity expenditures of the wealthy and because poor children were less likely to be superior. The acceptance of the race suicide thesis to a greater or lesser extent by women, such as Julia Wardhow and Ida Huss, Husted Harper reflected the suffrage movement's cap capitulation to the racist posture of Southern women. If the suffragists acquiesced to the arguments invoking the extension of the ballot to women as the saving grace of white supremacy, then birth control advocates either acquiesced to or supported the new arguments invoking birth control as a means of preventing the proliferation of the lower classes and as an antidote to the race suicide. Race suicide could be prevented by the introduction of birth control among Black people, immigrants, and the poor in general. In this way, the prosperous whites of the solid Yankee stock could maintain their superior numbers within the population. Thus, class-based and racism crept into the birth control movement when it was still in its infancy. More and more, it was assumed within birth control cycle circles that poor women, Black and immigrant alike, had a moral obligation to restrict the size of their families and what was demanded as a right for the privilege came to be interpreted as a duty for the poor. When Margaret Sanger embarked upon her lifelong crusade for birth control, a term she coined and popularized, it appeared as though the racist and anti-working class overtones of the previous period might possibly be overcome. For Margaret Higgins Sanger, it came from a working class background herself and was well acquainted with the devastating pressures of poverty. 
When her mother died at the age of 48, she had borne no less than 11 children. Sanger's later memories of her own family's trouble had confirmed her belief that working class women had a special need for the right to plan and space their pregnancies autonomously. Her affiliation as an adult with the socialist movement was a further cause for hope that the birth control campaign would move in in a more progressive direction. When Margaret Sanger joined the Socialist Party in 1912, she assumed the responsibility of recruiting women from New York's working women's clubs in the party. The call the party's paper carried her articles on the women's page. She wrote a series entitled What Every Woman, What Every Mother Should Know, another called What Every Girl Should Know, and she did on the spot coverage of the strikes involving women. Sanger's familiarity with the New York working class district was a result of her numerous visits as a trained nurse to the poor sections of the city. During these visits, she points out in her autobiography, she met countless of women who desperately desired the knowledge about birth control. According to Sanger's autobiography, Sorry, reflections. One of the many visits she made as a nurse to the New York Lower East Side convinced her to undertake a personal crusade for birth control. Answering one of her routine calls, she discovered that 28-year-old Sadie Sachs, who had attempted to abort herself. Once the crisis had passed, the young woman asked the attending physician to give her advice on birth prevention. As Sanger relates the story, the documented the doctor recommended that she tell her husband, Jake, to sleep on the roof. I glanced quickly to Ms. Sachs, even though my sudden tears I could see staped on her face an expression of absolute despair. We simply looked at each other, saying no word, until the door had closed behind the doctor. Then she lifted her thin, blue-veined hands and clasped them beseechingly. He can't understand. He's only a man. But you do, don't you? Please tell me the secret, and I'll never breathe it to a soul, please. And three months later, say it. Sadie Sachs died from another self-induced abortion. That night, Margaret Sanger says she vowed to devote all of her energy towards the acquisition and dissemination of contraceptive measures. I went to bed knowing that no matter what it might cost, I had finished with pall palliatives and superficial cures. I resolved to seek out the root of evil, to do something to change the destiny of mothers whose miseries were as vast as the sky. During the first phase of Singer's birth control crusade, she maintained her affiliation with the Socialist Party, and the campaign itself was closely associated with the rising militancy of the working class. Her staunch supporters included Eugene Debs, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, and Emma Goldman, who respectively represent the Socialist Party, the International Workers of the World, and the Anarchist Movement. Margaret Sanger, in turn, expressed the anti-capitalist commitment of her own movement within the pages of its journal, Women Web Rebel which was dedicated to the interests of working women. Personally, she counted, she continued to march on picket lines with striking workers and publicly condemned the outrageous assaults on striking workers. In 1914, for example, when the National Guard massacred scores of Chicano miners in Little Colorado, Sango joined the labor movement in exposing John D. Rockefeller's role in this attack. Unfortunately, the alliance between the birth control campaign and the radical labor movement did not enjoy a long life. While socialists and other working class activists continued to support the demand for birth control, it did not occupy a central place in their overall strategy. And Singer herself began to underestimate the centrality of the capitalist exploitation and her analysis of poverty, arguing that too many children caused workers to fall into their miserable predicament. Moreover, women were inadvertently perpetuating the exploitation of the working class. She believed by continually flooding the labor market with new workers. Ironically, Sanger may have been encouraged to adopt this position by neo Malthusian ideas embraced in the Southern Socialist circles. Such outstanding figures of the European Socialist movement as Anatole France and Rosa Luxemburg had proposed a birth strike to prevent the continued flow of labor into the capitalist market. When Margaret Sanger severed her ties with the, Cap the Socialist Party for the purpose of building an independent birth control campaign, she and her followers became more susceptible than ever before to the anti-Black and anti-immigrant propaganda of the times. Like their predecessors who had been deceived by the racial suicide propaganda, the advocates of birth control began to embrace the prevailing racist ideology. The fatal influence of the eugenics movement would soon destroy the progressive potential of the birth control campaign. In the first decades of the 20th century, the rising popularity of the eugenics movement was hardly a fortune a fortunate development. Eugenic ideas were perfectly suited to the ideology needs of the young monopoly capitalists. Imperialist excursions and 
Latin America and in the Pacific need to be justified, as do the intensified exploitation of black workers in the South and the immigrant workers in the North and West. The pseudo-scientific racial theories associated with the eugenics campaign furnish dramatic apologies for the conduct of the young monopolies. As a result, this movement won the unhesitating support of such leading capitalists as the Carnegies, the Harrimans, and the Kelloggs. By 1919, the eugenic influence on the birth control movement was unmistakably clear. In an article published by Margaret Sanger in the American Birth Control League's journal, she defined the chief issue of birth control as more children from the fit, less from the unfit. Around this time, the ABCL heartily welcomed the author, The Rising Tide of Color Against White World Supremacy in its Inner Sanctum. Lothrop Stoddard, Harvard professor and theoretic, direction of eugenics movement was offered a seat on the board of the directors. In the pages of the ABCL's journal articles of Guy Irving Birch, the director of the American Eugenics Society began to appear. Birch advocated birth control as a weapon to prevent the American people from being replaced by alien or Negro stock, whether it be by immigration or by overly high birth rates, among others in the country. In 1932, the eugenics movement had both that at least 26 states had passed compulsory sterilization laws and that thousands of unfit persons had already been surgically prevented from reproducing. Margaret Sanger offered for public approval of this development, morons, mental defectives, epileptic, illiterates, paupers, unemployables, criminals, prostitutes, and dope fiends ought to be surgically sterilized, she argued in a radio talk. She did not wish to be so intransigent as to leave them with no choice in the matter, if they wish, she said, they should be able to choose a lifelong segregated existence in labor camps. Within the American Birth Control League, the call for birth control among Black people acquired the same racist edge as the call for compulsory sterilization. In 1939, its successor, the Birth Control Federation of America, planned a Negro project. In the Federation's words, the mass of Negroes, particularly in the South, still breed carelessly and disastrously with the result but the increase among Negroes, even more than among whites, is from a portion of the population least fit and least able to rear children properly. Calling for the recruitment of Black ministers to lead local birth control committees, the Federation's proposal suggests that Black people should be rendered as vulnerable as possible as to their birth control propaganda. We do not want word to get out, wrote Margaret Singer in a letter to a colleague, that we want to exterminate the Negro population and the minister is the man who can straighten out that idea if it ever occurs to any of their more rebellious members. This episode in the birth control movement confirmed the ideological victory of the racism associated with the eugenics idea. It has been robbed of its progressive potential advocating for people of color, not the individual right to birth control, but rather the racist strategy of population control. Birth control campaign would be called upon to serve an essential capacity in the execution of the U.S. government's imperialism and racist population policy. The abortion right activists of the early 1970s should have examined the history of their movement. Had they done so, they might have understood why so many of their black sisters adopted a posture of suspicion towards their cause. They might have understood how important it was to undo the racist deeds of their predecessors who have advocated birth control as well as compulsory sterilization as a means of eliminating the unfit sectors of population. Consequently, the young white fem feminists might have been more receptive to the suggestion that their campaign for abortion right included vigorous condemnation of sterilization abuse, which had become more widespread than ever. It was not until the media decided that the casual sterilization of two black girls in Montgomery, Alabama, was a scandal worth reporting that the Pandora's box of steriliz sterilization abuse was finally flung open. By the time the case of the Ralph sisters broke, it was practically too late to influence the politics of the abortion rights movement. It was the summer of 1973 and the Supreme Court's decision legalizing abortions had already been announced in January. Nonetheless, the urgent need for mass opposition to sterilization abuse became tragically clear. The facts surrounding the Ralph sisters story was horrifyingly simple. Minnie Lee, who was 12 years old, and Mary Alice, who was 14, had been unsuspectingly carted into an operating room where surgeons irrevocably robbed them of their capacity to bear children. The surgery had been ordered by the HEW-funded Montgomery Community Action Committee after it was discovered that Depo Provera, a drug previously administered to the girls as a birth prevention measure, caused cancer in test animals. 
After the Southern Poverty Law Center filed suit on behalf of the Ralph sisters, the girl's mother revealed that she had unknowingly consented to the operation, having been deceived by the social workers who handed her daughter's case. They had asked Ms. Ralph, who I was unable to read, to put her ex on a document that con the contents of which were not described to her. She assumed, she said, that it authorized the continued devil provera injections. And she sus subsequently learned she had authorized the surgical sterilization of her daughters. In the aftermath of the publicity exposing the Ralph sisters' case, similar episodes were brought to light. In Montgomery alone, 11 girls, also in the teens, have been similarly sterilized. HEW funded birth control clinics in other states, as it turned out, and had also subjugated young girls to sterilization abuse. Moreover, individual women came forth with an equally outrageous stories. Niall Ruth Cox, for example, for example, filed so against the state of North Carolina at the age of 18, eight years before the suit, officials had threatened to discontinue her family's welfare payments if she refused to submit to surgical sterilization. Before she ascended to the operation, she was asserted that her infertility would be temporary. Now Ruth Cox's lawsuit was aimed at a state which had diligently practiced the theory of eugenics. Under the auspices of the Eugenics Commission of the North Carolina, so it was learned, 7,686 sterilizations have been carried out since 1933. Although the operations were justified as measures to prevent the reproduction of mentally deficient persons, about 5,000 of the sterilized persons have been black. According to the Brenda Hugh and Fosto, the ACL attorney representing now Ruth Cox, North Carolina's recent record was not much better. Okay. Oh, sorry, I was muted. Thank you, Pearl. Um, so as far as I can determine, the statistic reveal that since 1964, approximately 65% of the women sterilized in North Carolina were black and approximately 35% were white. As a flurry of publicity exposing sterilization abuse revealed, the neighboring state of South Carolina had been the site of further atrocities. 18 women from the Aiken, South Carolina, charged that they had been sterilized by a Dr. Clovis Pierce during the early 1970s. The sole obstetrician in that small town, Pierce had consistently sterilized Medicaid recipients with two or more children. According to a nurse in his office, Dr. Pierce insisted that pregnant welfare women will have to submit to voluntary sterilization if they wanted him to deliver their babies. While he was tired of people running around and having babies and paying for them with my taxes, Dr. Pierce received some $60,000 in taxpayers' money for the sterilizations he performed. During his trial, he was supported by the South Carolina Medical Association, whose members declared that doctors have a moral and legal right to insist on sterilization permission before accepting a patient if it is done on the initial visit. Revelations of sterilization abuse during that time, exposed the complicity of the federal government. At first, the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare claimed that approximately 16,000 women and 8,000 men had been sterilized in 1972 under the auspice, aus, auspices of federal programs. Later, however, these figures underwent a drastic revision. Carl Schultz, director of the HEW's Hughes Population Affairs Office estimated that between 100,000 and 200,000 sterilization, sterilizations had actually been funded that year by the federal government. During Hitler's Germany, Germany incidentally, 250,000 sterilizations were carried out under the Nazis' her, herid, hereditary health law. Is it possible that the record of the Nazis throughout the years of their reign may have been almost equaled by the U.S. government-funded sterilizations in the space of a single year. Given the historical genocide inflicted on the Native population of the United States, one would assume that Native American Indians would be exempted from the government sterilization campaign. But according to Dr. Connie Uri's testimony in a Senate committee hearing, by 1976, some 24% of all Indian women of childbearing age had been sterilized. Our blood... Our bloodlines are being stopped, the Choctaw physician told the Senate committee. Our unborn will not be born. This is genocidal to our people. According to Dr. Uri, the Indian Health Services Hospital in Claremore, Oklahoma, have been sterilizing one out of every woman giving birth in that federal facility. 
Native American Indians are special targets of government propaganda and sterilization. In one of the few pamphlets aimed at Indian people, there is a sketch of a family with 10 children and one horse and another sketch of a family with one child and 10 horses. The drawings are supposed to imply that more children meant more poverty and fewer children, fewer children mean wealth, as if the 10 horses owned by the one-child family had been magically conjured up by birth control and sterilization surgery. The domestic population policy of the U.S. government has an undeniably racist edge. Native American, Chicana, Puerto Rican, and Black women continue to be sterilized in disproportionate numbers. According to a national fertility study conducted in 1970 by Princeton University's Office of Population Control, 20% of all married Black women have been permanently sterilized. Approximately the same percentage of Chicana women has been rendered surgically infertile. Moreover, 43% of the women sterilized through federally subsidized programs were Black. The astonishing number of Puerto Rican women who have been sterilized reflects a special government policy that can be traced back to 1939. In that year, President Roosevelt's Interdepartmental Committee on Puerto Rico issued a statement attributing the island's economic problems to the phenomenon of overpopulation. This committee proposed that efforts be undertaken to reduce the birth rate to no more than the level of the death rate. Soon afterward, an experimental sterilization campaign was undertaken in Puerto Rico, although the Catholic Church initially opposed this experiment and forced the cessation of the program in 1946. It was, cover it was converted during the early 1950s to the teachings and practice of pop population control. In this period, over 150 birth control clinics were opened, resulting in a 20% decline in population growth by the mid-1960s. By the 1970s, over 35% of all Puerto Rican women of childbearing age had been surgically sterilized. According to Bonnie Mass, a serious critic of the U.S. government's population policy, if purely mathematical projections are to be taken seriously, if the present rate of sterilization of 19,000 monthly were to continue, then the island's population of workers and peasants could be extinguished within the next 10 or 20 years, establishing for the first time in world history a systemic, system, systematic use of population control capable of eliminating an entire generation of people. During the 1970s, the devastating implications of the Puerto Rican experiment began to emerge with unmistakable clarity. In Puerto Rico, the presence of corporations in the highly automated metallurgical and pharmaceutical industries had ex ex exacerbated the problem of unemployment. The prospect of an ever larger army of unemployed workers was one of the main incentives for the mass sterilization program. In South the United States today, enormous numbers of people of color and especially racially oppressed youth have become part of a pool of permanently unemployed workers. It is hardly coincidental, considering the Puerto Rican example, that the increasing incidence of sterilization has kept pace with the high rate of unemployment. As growing numbers of white people suffer the brutal consequences of unemployment, they can also expect to become targets of the official sterilization propaganda. The prevalence of sterilization abuse during the latter 1970s may be greater than ever before. Although the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, Welfare issued guidelines in 1974, which were ostensibly de designed to prevent involuntary sterilizations, the situation has nonetheless deteriorated. When the American Civil Liberties Union Reproductive Freedom Project conducted a survey of teaching hospitals in 1975, they discovered that 40% of those institutions were not even aware of the regulations issued by Hugh. Only 30% of the hospitals examined by the ACLU were even attempting to comply with the guidelines. The 1977 Hyde Amendment has added yet another dim dimension to coercive sterilization practices. As a result of this law passed by Congress, Federal funds for abortions were eliminated in all cases, but those involving rape and the risk of death or severe illness. According to Sandra Salazar of the California Department of Public Health, the first victim of the Hyde Amendment was a 27-year-old Chicana woman from Texas. She died as a result of an illegal abortion in Mexico shortly after Texas discontinued government-funded abortions. There have been many more victims, women for whom sterilization has become the only alternative to abortions, which are currently beyond their reach. Sterilizations continue to be federally funded and free to poor women on demand. Over the last decade, the struggle against sterilization abuse has been waged primarily by Puerto Rican, Black, Chicana, and Native American women. 
Their cause has not yet been embraced by the women's movement as a whole. Within organizations representing the interests of middle-class white women, there has been a certain reluctance to support the demands of the campaign against sterilization abuse, for these women are often denied their individual rights to be sterilized when they desire to take this step. While women of color are urged at every turn to become permanently infertile, white women enjoying prosperous economic conditions are urged by the same forces to reproduce themselves. They therefore sometimes consider the waiting period and other details of the demand for informed consent to sterilization as further inconveniences for women like themselves. Yet, whatever the inconven inconveniences for white middle-class women, a fundamental reproductive right of racially oppressed and poor women is at stake. Sterilization abuse must be ended. And that's it. Um, thank you to everybody who uh, stayed the, <laughs> up until now and um, listened in. Special shout out to Nadia. Really appreciate you coming. Um, so it's nice seeing your name here. Um, and thank you to everybody who participated and helped us out with reading. Uh, and yeah, we hope that this was an impactful um, two hours and uh, Michelle and I picked out the chapters just because we thought it was really relevant to um, our work here at OSH and just like current events as well. Um, and so we're really glad that we were able to make things work um, at such short notice. So um, yeah, Michelle, do you have any words or feel good about wrapping up? Oh yeah. Um Thank you so much for joining us, um, especially to end Black History Month with um, an educational experience and passing on um, an author who wrote um, about past events and it's actually really relevant to current events. And it's not just Black History Month, it's all year round. Um, so we hope to do this again next year and we really appreciate this. So, thank you. Yeah, thank you, everyone. This was really good. Thank you guys for doing this. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Have a good evening. Have a good night. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. That was really good. Bye. Oh, let me end this the stream yard. <laughs>